Welcome to a very special edition of the MIT Open Documentary Lab's public lecture series, and it's the last one of this semester. Uh, today we're presenting a panel called Interactive Immersive Media as Stories That Matter, Peabody Awards Expanded Recognition in Storytelling. My name is Kat Cizek. I'm the Artistic Director of the Co-Creation Studio here at the lab, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm a white Gen X woman with brown hair and glasses with a big smile today. Today, I'm in Tecoronto on the shores of Lake Caniatario, dish with one spoon territory. For 82 years, the Peabody Awards have recognized stories that matter in broadcasting. Now, Peabody has expanded its recognition to interactive and immersive media, and that means games, XR, interactive documentary, as well as many others. They've done so by awarding 16 legacy awardees, iconic and pioneering works to demonstrate the depth of these digital formats and the foundational standards for future award recipients. I'm really honored to sit as a juror on this inaugural inter inter interactive board for the Peabody. And I'm thrilled to be in conversation today with Dr. Jeffrey Jones, Executive Director of Peabody, and Diana Williams, Chairwoman of the Peabody Interactive Awards. Hey, Diana and Jeff, great to see you here today. Thank you. Great to be here. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Today, we're gonna to walk through the Legacy Awards together, and it's a really rich collection. But first, I thought we'd start with the ethos of the Peabody and your personal connections to the very mission of the awards, stories that matter. Jeff, you're a professor and scholar at the intersection of politics, satire, and entertainment. You've written and edited six books, including Entertain Entertaining Politics, New Political Television, and Civic Culture. Why do the Peabody stories matter to you? Well, first, thanks for this and great to be here. Um, yeah, for me, uh, you know, humans are what we call the storytelling animal and the Peabody Awards are not a craft award per se, uh, but truly an award about uh, how narratives shape our lives and help us understand and find meaning. Uh, you know, the classic example would be the Bible or holy books. Uh, we tell stories because we believe they shape how we should not just understand the world, but approach the world. And so for uh, much of my career as a professor of, uh, of political communication, I talked about how media doesn't serve democracy well. And for the last nine years, I've been very privileged to take the very best of media and demonstrate how stories do help shape uh, our world in a positive way. And that's, uh, that's what we do. And that's why this extension into digital interactive and immersive spaces is so significant for, uh, for the institution. And Diana, you're, you're a much sought after award-winning multi-platform producer. Uh, you're currently CEO and co-founder at Kinetic Energy entertainment. You're super busy making work and developing IP and franchises. You work with emergent talent and established a talent to make sure that all voices are included in an ever evolving industry. What drew you to this really hard work of being our chairwoman? Uh, I think it was the hard work because it was worth it um, to be able to recognize all forms of storytelling and what stories can do for you physically, spiritually, mentally, it, um, and you know, to Jeff's point, we tell stories because not only do, uh, does it give information, um, but it can also, you know, stories can ask you just to kind of take a look around at the world around you and talk, think about your place in it. And is this the right place? And what do you want to change? And, you know, are you that agent for change? Or it can just entertain you for a moment. It can do both things and do it well. Um, and to be able to recognize that that same feeling and force and ambition and innovation happens across many different media and platforms um, made it all the more exciting. And to have it um, be such an esteemed organization that has always spoken about how stories can matter and to put it across, I thought was um, um, such an exciting adventure to be a part of. And I was really excited to um, be able to be here. It's an amazing thing to honor stories that matter. And the way that the juries work is quite different than other awards. Um, can you talk a little bit about the unique nature of the juries, Jeff? 
Yeah, I would start and then Diana throw in if as someone who experiences it. But yeah, it's um, it is the deliberative nature uh, that probably distinguishes us, which is a small board in this instance of 15 individuals who meet face to face uh, in three separate meetings and then arrive at a unanimous decision uh, about uh, a, a winner. Uh, you can't become a winner with any kind of dissenting vote. And so what that means is you're really asking colleagues who are deeply steeped in experts in media to also act as citizens, not just their passions about or opinions about technological innovation or uh, the craft of doing something well. But, but what is it about particular social issues? Uh, what is it uh, about how the storytelling can articulate that, that we can agree upon as citizens deserve recognition as powerful storytelling. So that's it's a real different process than most juries, uh, which are often from a distance, anonymous, most votes win. Uh, and so that, that's what really sets us apart for sure. Citizenship, Diana, how do you feel about that on a jury? <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, it's it's tricky it's challenging but i think that's what makes it special um and the fact that everyone you know on the board were we're all practitioners of of that which we are also um judging and so it makes it we, we all have a lot of feelings you know as human beings we just have a lot of feelings and uh you're also trying to be objective and subjective and you're looking at that project and the creator and you're talking about it in terms of not only just that that project, but also what it means to the platforms as a whole. So it's, it, you know, it gets heated and it gets tricky, but it's all about the award and about that creator and about the thing that, that has been created. Let's go back in history. Um, I think it's worth looking at um, the sizzle reel that the Peabody made on the occasion of its 75th anniversary. Let's see what this looks like. Walter Cronkite once said, you count your Emmys, you cherish your Peabody's. That's the way it is. No award in the world of storytelling is more revered, more coveted. Peabody is like an Oscar wrapped in an Emmy inside a Pulitzer. Because there are stories, and then there are stories that matter. The kind that change our world, or at least the way that we see it. The kind that bring tears of sorrow and laughter. Good evening, my fellow Americans. The Peabody's began at the birthplace of American public higher education. A place that values and celebrates the creative inspiration of all citizens. And here, in the vaults of the University of Georgia, these stories are kept safe. Never forgotten. A dream. It will transform the whole of American society. A moment of inspiration. A legacy frozen in time for the world to cherish. Mrs. Kennedy has been showing us about the White House Stories that are our nation and our world. A story of us. With its blemishes. The industrial system employed children as young as six and seven. And its triumphs. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. From the beginning, Peabody has been about more than excellence. Stories that addressed issues and ideas in a thoughtful manner. Stories that challenged the mind. Broke new ground. Good night and good luck. That tradition continues. Evidenced by recent winners who continue to challenge the industry. Open our eyes and our hearts. My name is Temple Brandon. I'm not like other people. And now, as the Peabody's turn 75, 
we look back on those who've inspired us. And we wait. We listen. We watch. To see who will be next. To give us a story that matters. Jeff, how did the Peabody's begin? And uh, across the decades, how specifically have the Peabody's addressed technological innovation and also cultural vibe shifts? Yeah, so um, Peabody, in 1940, National Association of Broadcasters wanted to create a, uh, a Pulitzer for radio. And if you know, it was a mass medium at that time, but was widely disrespected as a medium, if you know your media history. Uh, and so by creating such an award, uh, it would bestow some of the best works in radio um, with that kind of status that the Pulitzer had done for journalists. Pulitzer is located at University, excuse me, at Columbia University. So the uh, Peabody's were created at the University of Georgia for radio. As you might know, then in 1948, when television uh, comes about, the three major networks migrate most of their content to television. And so Peabody naturally began recognizing that as well. Uh, the award goes to entertainment, news, and documentary, uh, television and radio. And then as technological change occurs across the years into cable, and then with the web, in the late 90s, we give our first Peabody Award to the internet in 2001. So uh, the bottom line is uh, that this recognition of changes technologically, uh, Peabody has seen uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, the mechanisms for telling stories, the technology for telling stories might change, but ultimately their receptivity by a broader public uh, is what is is what matters, and so uh, the board has adapted. And then what we're discussing today is the latest adaptation. And we'll get to this in a second, I believe. That while we began recognizing digital uh, media in the early 2000s, we weren't doing a sufficient job, and so this is an effort or a corrective. Uh, but also, the industry has grown and changed in those 20 years as well. Uh, and so uh, timing is, is good. Yeah, it's worth noting that the Peabody's have always had this unique quality, this ability uh, to be nimble and respond to the current moment of, of, of the time. Um, I think it's worth noting that in 1949, Peabody gave the New Yorker an award for their successful campaign in stopping music and commercial announcements in Grand Central Station. Or in 1991, Peabody awarded KTLA TV in Los Angeles for the presentation of the Rodney King beating videotape and subsequent reportage. Um, do you want to speak, Diana, to that 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 history uh, that exists at the Peabody for for really trying to recognize stories that matter? You know, I think what I have always found so interesting and learning about the the Peabody is. It's also, yes, it's awarding stories that matter, but it's also awarding the the boldness behind finding that story that matters, the 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 trying something, the the daring and the caring that goes on to to any creation, especially if you are attempting to find a different lens into something um, that you think people may know, or even providing a lens into something that you think has not been shown, um, and then putting your own um, creative perspective on it. Uh, so, you know, I think that through the 75 years and now on to what we're doing, um, it just continues to walk that path of looking for innovation and ambition in, in the stories and the storytellers and how the story is being told. Yeah, that's a great that's a great way of framing it, Diana, this idea that it's always bold. Um, it's the stories that matter and put into the world in a very bold way. And despite that, um, there were still gaps in the way that Peabody was able to address this technology and the, these cultural and political 
interventions, shall we call them? Um, and so a new board was created. Uh, Jeff, can you talk about why, why that happened and how you did it? Yeah, if, if I could go back though, I, I do want to address that um, it wasn't, Peabody's not always, how can I put this? It's not just about its technological innovation, but that the board not being a craft award, best director, best actress type of thing, it, the, the board has definitely assumed a normative voice, a judgment uh, of media. So in 1964, the board gave an award to all the broadcast networks for their coverage of the civil rights movement, understanding that showing uh, African-American children being sprayed across the streets of Birmingham um, had a particular power uh, that needed to be recognized. Conversely, in 2004, the board refused to give any award to networks that submitted their works for their coverage of the Gulf War, feel liking they, they had abdicated their responsibility for the kind of critical coverage we needed as citizens. So there's, a, there's an ethical moral judgment uh, for media performance that the board exudes in the most recent, in my tenure, uh, a lot of what we've done with the traditional broadcast board has been about diverse and emerging voices uh, and uh, often highlighting uh, the, you know, uh, the Donald Glovers and the Joey Soloways and uh, Aziz Ansari's at the, at, at the front end, Issa Rae's of, the, of, their, of their emergence onto the scene. So, so that normative voice is important. And, and I think that is uh, what this board will do too. But anyway, that was a, to go back to, to answer your question, what happened for, uh, for me is a realization that there was an array of powerful stories that were not sufficiently being submitted to Peabody and that when they were being submitted, the structuration of the judging was not sufficient for being able to process what they were seeing. That is to say, that board was dominated by people that understood television and radio very well, but were not steeped in uh, the language uh, or the <laughs> lingua franca of how, what is immersive and in, in interactive media. So uh, we created in really 2014, 2015, uh, a thing called Futures of Media Award, which was kind of a beta for what we have now. Uh, and the double entendre was that it was going to be judged by University of Georgia students who did an excellent job uh, as the future of media producers, but also the future of media that the that, that digital interactive immersive pointed toward. And we ran that project very successfully for four or five years, recognizing such um, amazing works as, as things like that drag games like that dragon cancer or life is strange or um, one of our winners today, Forensic Architecture for its interactive documentary, said Naya, um, and, and other properties like that. And so for me, what happened is instead of Peabody rec uh, recognizing, um, you know, uh, these stories through kind of a redheaded stepchild, if you will, no disrespect to redheads, uh, but using that phrase, um, uh, with a secondary award, it became clear to me that I thought that these media deserve a full Peabody Award and that they deserve to be judged by people who deeply knew the form. So uh, to jump to the chase, we created a board and, uh, and have set the stage for what we're talking about today uh, for, for giving awards in these spaces. Great. Let's let's move to the to the awards, the Legacy Awards. Um, let's see the uh, sixteen in a row first, and then we'll dive deep into each one or most of them.
So four special awards off the top. Um, we'll look at two of them. The Foundations Award for Eliza. And this one goes back to 1964. <laughs> um, and here at MIT, Eliza is actually created at MIT before Alexa and before Siri, there was Eliza. Eliza is a computer program that anyone can converse with via the keyboard and it'll reply on the screen. We've added human speech to make the conversation more clear. Men are all alike. In what way? They're always bugging us about something or other. Can you think of a specific example? Well, my boyfriend made me come here. Your boyfriend made you come here? He says um, I'm depressed much of the time. I'm sorry to hear that you're depressed. It's true. I am unhappy. Do you think coming here will help you not to be unhappy? The computer's replies seem very understanding, but this program is merely triggered by certain phrases to come out with stock responses. Nevertheless, Weizenbaum's secretary fell under the spell of the machine. And I asked her to my office and sat her down at the keyboard, and then she began to type. And of course, I looked over her shoulder to make sure that everything was operating properly. After two or three interchanges with, uh, with the machine, she turned to me and she said, would you mind leaving the room, please? Diana, why Eliza for a foundational award? I mean, I, the, the award says it all. I mean, everything that, that we do now and controls us now comes from Eliza. How we, how we so, it, it's about seamless interactions. And to think that it was done in the 60s uh, before the computing power that we have now. And even now, think about it, we, complain because you know how that doesn't come on like that or that you know how dare Siri not understand the words that I'm slurring into a machine that is 50 feet away well all of our frustrations and excitement to everything is due to Eliza it is due to um you know what Eliza did is it showed the potential and the possibilities and and I think that it also just goes across everything that is being done in these realms is about potential and possibilities. Even sending the human out of the room so you can be alone with your... <laughs> Alone with my thoughts with the laptop. <laughs> alone with your device. <laughs> okay, great. So that's Eliza Foundational. There's um, something called the Institutional Award and this went to Forensic Architecture, um, a group out of London, UK. Let's take a look at this one. Mark Duggan was shot dead by police after the minicab he was travelling in was pulled over. My name is Eyal Weizmann. I am a professor at Goldsmiths, University of London, where I direct the research project Forensic Architecture. Our material is being presented in national and international courts in citizen assemblies and truth commissions and human rights reports in the UN, but also it is presented in the media, it is presented in galleries. We are a group of about 25 of us, a very multidisciplinary group that uses architectural tools and techniques in order to counter-investigate state violence worldwide. Bronze monuments to slavery declare allegiance to a dying myth of white supremacy. In 2017, Louisiana state authorities bowed to long-standing activist demands to take him down. And yet the structural legacy of settler colonialism and slavery remains intact. It pervades the air we breathe. I started my career as an architect and as an academic. And I was writing books and I was telling stories, but I wanted my stories to matter. And for this reasons, I wanted to place them in the most antagonistic of fora, uh, within court cases that are difficult, standing with communities that are exposed to state violence, and make a change with the stories that we are telling. Another project based at a university. Um, Jeff, tell us how architects creating visual evidence for use in courts can be considered as media and stories that matter. Yeah, you know, I mentioned earlier that that uh, the beta for this recognized uh, this group's um, uh, piece called Sednyaya about a Syrian torture prison. 
And uh, I, there's just a particular power to forensic evidence. Uh, Peabody has been recognizing with the other board. Uh, journalists doing this, the New York Times in particular, has a wonderful piece that was nominated this year called Day of Rage, where you're splicing together different sources to forensically uncover truth. And what's powerful about forensic architecture is that these aren't journalists. They are professors they, from multiple disciplines, as, as he says, uh, with, a, with, with, with a specific focus on state violence, which is, uh, you know, uh, unlike reporters who do various things, uh, this is a particular counter narrative that's getting produced. Uh, the one uh, uh, for Sednyaya was, uh, was, was Amnesty International. And you think about the only way we often know about torture is through oral testimony. What does it mean then to uh, recover that in a visual way and let the user direct themselves through those kinds of spaces? So while he talks about courts uh, and this kind of evidence that can be used by citizen groups, it's also the user experience of being able to, to forensically recreate these kinds of things, to see differently, to understand differently, to make meaning differently. And to me, that's just a tremendously powerful way of seeing the world through a different lens. Definitely, and using the media within a spatialized context. It's, you know, they, they invented this genre of, of placing all these artifacts into a context that makes meaning of a larger whole, which is phenomenal. Um, and, you know, we've, Peabody, as we said, we don't really officially have categories per se. Um, but there are genres and forms and fields that we certainly considered for the Legacy Awards. Can you, um, Diana, talk about how we went about figuring that out and what they mean for us right now in the context of the Legacy? Yeah, um, you know, when we, you know, when we look at, you know, the other board for the Peabody, film, television, journalism, it's, you know, these are established the industries. Um, that are recognized internally and externally by the audience. And then when look at these other, other types of, of formats and media and storytelling, you know, some are not as known publicly. Um, and so that was one thing that was on our mind. Like, how can we get these known? Um, who's, you know, going back to the word bold, who, are, who has, has chosen to boldly tell stories on other types of platforms when it could have been film, could have been television, could have been straight print journalism, um, but instead thought that another lens, another way in was a way to go. So we just started kind of looking at first, like our personal taste. What have you done in the past? What did you check out? What's, what weird little computer game did you have? What, you know, what had you heard about? What, you know, what, um, what you know, on some like cool hunting type of early online um, uh, media, did you read about something cool that you wished you had been able to have done? And then we started to put them into, you know, quote unquote categories of just like, these feel like XR, these are VR, you know, here's this piece of, you know, inter interactive journalism, which we didn't, even, you know, these are also things that we didn't know even had titles and names. They were just things that we did. They were things that we experienced. Um, and so that was kind of how we used to start a group. And so you just start from here and you just start to kind of then get smaller and smaller and smaller. And then you start to find things in those, you know, again, quote unquote categories. And they became more like thinking about them as, um, you know, to quote Jay Bushman, more like tags in that, you know, they all had, they were all illuminating storytelling, storytelling, but then also each had their own particular thing about them. And so that's, I think that's our, why our hesitancy is to just say a category, because a lot of these defy category, which is a very strict box that something has to sit in and men in this type of storytelling just doesn't. Yeah, I remember you at the whiteboard trying to map it all out. And I think, you know, what's so cool about the projects that were ultimately honored uh, and, and most of the ones that we considered had tags from many, many different of these categories or fields. So really there's such a cross pollination across um, the, the things that we were considering and the things that we're making and, and, and are out there. Um, can, I, and can, I, can I just add, I mean, the, the, I really appreciate Diana saying that. The, you know, like music, you know, categories are for marketing and sales <laughs> and for cognitive 
lack of dissidence, you know, clarity. But for creators, uh, you know, like musicians, they have stories they want to tell and they don't really care about boundaries. So what's great about this board is we basically license this board to uh, to do away with that and look across. And so Diane is right that tagging might be a better way for us to cognitively understand that something can be many things at once and that ultimately at the end of the day that's less important best actress best director than is uh, how powerful is the story and how well was the digital technology used to tell it so one tag that's stuck and i'm super personally happy about is co-creation <laughs> it's deep in our wheelhouse over here at co-creation studio at open documentary lab um, and many of the projects that were honored in the end um, have that tag to them, um, including Star Wars Uncut. Let's take a look at this one. Star Wars Uncut is a crowdsourced uh, remake of the original Star Wars A New Hope. Um, crowdsourcing means you are asking people online or anywhere in the world to work together to make something. And how it worked is that you went to StarWarsUncut.com and you would see uh, all these thumbnails of uh, 473 scenes from the original Star Wars A New Hope and you go in and you claim one for yourself. And once you claim it, you have 30 days to recreate that scene however you want. It could be animation, stop motion, live action, whatever you want. And it would go on the website for anyone in the world to watch. What ended up happening once I got all these scenes and got multiple versions of them, me and my friends picked out some of the, our the favorite scenes of each version of each of the 473 scenes. And so we stitched it all together to recreate Star Wars A New Hope uh, made by the people. Everyone gets to have a lightsaber in this world. Jeff, tell us about Star Wars Uncut. Yeah, co-creation is actually one that I have deep affection for as well. Um, in media studies, we often talk about the uh, word polysemy, the many meanings, and that the act of making meaning is often as much, if not more so, by the audience than those who encode the text or produce the text. And what, what, what the beauty of Star Wars is, is you get to see a couple things. One is that uh, it's a deeply meaningful text to a lot of people. In fact, maybe one of the biggest media franchises in that regard. And so the clips we see of how different people render that film and want to bring it to life with their children or their various costumes or animation or what have you, shows their own creativity, their own engagement with a media property and the meaning they make from it. And then, and then the, the co-creation of just bringing that all together, realizing that, that at times you can use many minds to bring together to create something. Joseph Gordon-Levitt's uh, hit record is another example that's been popularized and still continues to this day. But Star Wars Uncut was the first. And uh, again, because many of us have deep affection for that film, uh, it really charted a path for our understanding of what the digital affordances of digital spaces would allow for in such the creation of new text from old text. And also, if I can just add to that, it just, it, um, it it's, it's a, it's how we're taking it into the also the, the digital visual medium because look, fan fiction has been around for a super duper long time. And even you can go back to like technically the certain stories in the Bible that are fan fiction, like you know, sure. the way that they were proposed. So it's you know, what I love so much about Star Wars Uncut is it just took that idea and just and then really brought everybody into it because everyone just swing it around the lightsaber. <laughs> and how do you tell that story that is your personal story around that? And um, and beautifully structured within 473 scenes too. There's just this formality of it that helps hold it together in this in this meaningful way as well. Um, another co-creation project honored is World Without Oil. It unfolded online in 2007 and simulated a global oil shortage in over 32 days that the game ran. Every day played out one week of events, uh, charting worldwide ramifications of a global 
oil shock. Now that certainly is prescient for today. World Without Oil <clears throat> was also tagged as Transmedia as, um, and uh, another project was also called Transmedia. Let's take a look at this one. It's called The Beast. In some ways, The Beast was a dramatic explosion or extension of tabletop role-playing game um, concepts where you have um, game masters or puppet masters, as we became called because of the, of the movie itself, who are encouraging a collaborative storytelling experience. The premise was very much where, where we would write a story, we would create all the evidence as if that story had actually taken place. We would place that evidence around the digital and physical world and and leave little breadcrumbs to what we call the rabbit hole for people to come in to that world find those little bits of evidence and discuss them with each other this audience this group of people is so much smarter than we thought they were very first day surprise they solved all six months of content in about two hours that was the day I installed a, a bed in my office because I knew I'm not going home ever. We we were really worried because as, as they first started to sort of form up and there was a lot of discourse, uh, that they were going right at the throat of the story, that they were going to solve the story before we even got started. Right at the throat of the beast. Diana, what is the beast? What I, what I know I love so much about The Beast is that um, when it launched and when it was happening, you know, there was no name for it. Nobody knew what to call this type of storytelling. First, I don't think they wanted to call it storytelling because it was marketing. It was, it was these uh, geniuses, these really smart, bright, ambitious people were brought on to market the Steven Spielberg's movie, Artificial Intelligence. That's what it was, you know, the marketing effort but it became a chain reaction of story, of participation, of digital storytelling, of artifacts, of being in also uh, taking that digital um, feeling and then bringing it into IRL, into real life. Um, so it brought together all these pieces and what I think is so amazing and why I love transmedia, whatever word you wanna call it is that when done well, if that one piece you are doing or experiencing or reading or playing or whatever is wholly satisfying, you're good. If you know about everything else that is happening as well and you want to go down that rabbit hole and find everything, you're also good. But that's, you want to be able to bring in both types of people and that's what the beast did beautifully. Um, and if we think about it, it's kind of like, it's, a, it's certainly a precursor to where we are today with what goes on in discords, um, you know, with the idea of community coming together around one thing and whether it is enjoying that thing or solving that thing or experiencing that thing, um, the beast was at, at the forefront of it. And, you know, as Alan said about sleeping in there, like, you know, when people solve that and figure that out so fast, you have to change course. And I think that's that's also what we wanted to award was the thinking behind it, the, the story architecture, the experience architecture that's behind it, and then the players that came into it. And it was, I, I believe the name was Cloud Collective that really came together, the Yahoo group and brought it together. Um, and you know, the funny thing is, I believe that one of the war rooms that they had for it um, was called Eliza's Tea Room. Again, hearkening back to Eliza, the original uh, AI. So um, all of these things, that's, we, that's what we wanted to really point out is that how everything kind of builds on each other. It's definitely a huge culture and, and it gives whole new meaning to trust your audience, right? Like it, it puts those artifacts of the media into, into the world for us to experience and play and participate in rather than just consume. So really, really important work. Um, yeah, being part of it, but also being led by it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and still in the co-creation vein, there's Kipu, another um, uh, co-created project, um, an interactive documentary. Let's take a look at this one. We wanted to hear all the voices or as much voices as we could to tell the story 
with them and not about them. There were indigenous women living in rural areas with no uh, access, for example, to the web or the internet. So that's why we created this phone line connected to the web where they could call to this phone and tell their stories in their own ways. Hello, yo vengo de distrito independiente. Pero ya le digo vuelta a mi nombre. Yo soy del Pesería Niangalí. Aló, no cansan, pampa con la manta. Que yo también fui afectada por el tiempo de la violencia de que hicieron las ligaduras. What we wanted to do is to actually give a space and a platform for these women who didn't have uh, channels to actually make their voices heard. And this was actually one of the reasons that the policy was so successful in the, in the first place. Kibbutz are these ancient artifacts that were used to do accounting and to share stories. And basically they are made of these knotted threads where each thread and each knot contains certain amount of information. And be like the heart of the, of the project, this, this idea of the Kipu as a participatory collective memory archive, but also as a way of, of, of organizing this whole data because there were there were a lot to tell each thread of the kipu was going to be a testimony or a response from the audience and the different notes we used as different uh, topics so that the users could have different options on how to navigate the archive ancient technologies new technologies jeff what's what yeah. how do you do this one that's so friggin' cool, isn't it? I mean, I, 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 every time I see that, the way that was graphically rendered. So yeah, uh, let's use a, a technology from 1876 or whenever it's been so long since I've taught it, but uh, telephones from the 1880s, uh, they use voice over internet protocol. So maybe what was missing from that clip is under the Fujimori regime, regime thousands of Peruvians, indigenous Peruvians, women, mainly women, but some men, were engaged in forced sterilization by the government. And so the creators created an opportunity where these indigenous women could call in uh, anonymously on this line and use voice over internet protocol uh, to record that and then graphically render it. And as I, I posted, by the way, down in, uh, in the chat, uh, our, our website that has all of these interactive legacy winners and I very much encourage people to click in particular, this one to read about, because the write-up uh, talks about how, uh, not just the technological uh, nature of this, but how by doing this, it also created support networks among survivors, created a national movement for the reckoning of this, and rehearsal that these women did, if you will, for the potential court testimony over it. So this is a great example of a story that matters, not just in covering you know, the, the, the crimes and malfeasance of the Fujimori regime, but as much as about <laughs> um, how technology can foster things just by its creation using a damn telephone. <laughs> so I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of this project. I think it's awesome. Yeah, the telephone and Kipu as a technology, as you know, that yeah, exactly, exactly. the idea that technology is not something new, it's something that's been with us. Yeah, since exactly. time memorial, which is and really also cool. allowing it to, to give us as as the participants and as the, the viewers um, to have its impact. Could this have just been a 90 minute documentary of people of heads talking in translations? Sure. But to have impact and to cause change and for people to understand for us to be actively and physically and bodily involved in it and that that physical nature of the strings but also then the translation of it digitally i feel like you know was another level to bring us in to the story and to 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 ask us to ask questions nancy ford in the chat says cords all these cords in this project umbilical kipu threads and telephone cords what a beautiful poetic way of thinking about that one yeah um our next category is uh, sorry. Uh, our next category is XR, um, and uh, the project we're going to show is notes on blindness. Sorry about that.
This is cassette one, track one. Notes on blindness. And this is the 21st of June, 1983. Sitting in the park with the children, I hear the footsteps of people walking past me on the footpath. Further out to the right and behind me there's the car park and the sound of people starting and stopping their cars and driving off. Way off to the left there's the main road and the noise of the heavy traffic roaring past in the distance. The strange thing about it is that it's a world which consists only of activity. In the blind person's appreciation of weather, wind takes the place of sun. I know you had talked about Kipu and the power of using the Kipu digitally and having us relate to the story in such a different way. How does Notes on Blindness um, show or exemplify the power of telling this particular story with this particular immersive technology? Well, and this is a, a great example because this was a documentary to begin with. So this was a, here's John telling his story and it was a powerful documentary. But, and I believe it was Arnaud who said it, um, by putting it into XR, it just brings something different to his story. And it, um, by, by the nature of XR, by nature of VR, um, we were drawn to the experience. We were a part of his story and to, and we could really, I think, better understand. And, and that's why I think it's such a great clip that you used, um, where it's the power, power of, of wind takes the place of the sun. And we, and to be able to really, to, we can hear those words, we could, we could see him just say the words, but by being in VR, we were able to experience those words. Um, and so I think, you know, what we love so much about Notes on Blindness is that, again, because it had been a document, I believe it had been an audio podcast. Also, this just gave us another, another piece of the world to complete it. The other XR project um, that was honored is called Always in Season Island. It was built 12 years ago. It's a long time in the digital world in Second Life within the setting of a 1930 lynching in Marion, Indiana, when 10,000 white men, women, and children came to watch the torture and murder of two African-American men. Avoiding gratuitous violence, Always in Season Island offered visitors tasks to complete and prompts to consider that either encouraged or stopped the lynching from occurring, ultimately pushing the conventions of the documentary form and challenging audiences to intimately examine their own capacities for both dehumanization and change. In the interactive journalism category, you know, we know that journalism has been at the core of the Peabody since 1940. Um, so of course, we're going to be reflecting on its interactive nature in 20, in the 2000s, in, the, in this millennium. Um, an unexpected winner uh, for the Legacy Awards was the New York Times quiz called How Y'all Use and You Guys Talk in 2013. Um, I know I did the quiz back then. Um, I'm sure most of you did. Um, it asked readers to answer a series of questions about the words they use, prompting maps of common usage across the, the United States. This project was visited by tens of millions of users over only a few weeks. Diana, this was not a slam junk in the jury. Can you explain uh, the project and tell us why words and place matter? Um, we have one North Star, which is stories that matter. And everything is, that is, if, if you know, that is what we have to judge everything by. And um, this became a big discussion of, well, are we also trying to think about what the word story means? What is story? And where it got super heated was that 
it, it kind of also lends itself into co-creation and participation in that it was also about the stories that people told about why they clicked and why they picked a word as a as a proud New Jersey person. I speak only in use and I say it all the time. I, I write in emails, which is odd for a CEO, but it is it is important because it's a part of my identity and I tell the story about it and why, and just by nature of how heated it got <laughs> amongst the jurors proved the point that this was something that mattered because it was, a, it was the identification and it was this piece of journalism that told in this way that allowed us to be a part of it that, that showed that how important our identity matters and how important it is for us to express our identity. And so it, you know, as heat as it got and uh, it was the right, it was the right format. It just brought everything together. And so as you can tell, I'm very passionate, you know, as I say to all of you, you know, and then Jeffrey with his y'alls, it is, uh, it is our identification. And I was firmly in the you guys North North border category, <laughs> but we, I think we all agreed that it's more than just a quiz. Yeah. Um, another important work of interactive journalism that was awarded is called Fatal Force from Washington Post. It began in the aftermath of the Ferguson riots and the shooting of Michael Brown. Um, and we, we came out of that experience wanting to do something more. Wes Lowry, uh, who is not with the Post, but was with the Post at the time, had, a, had the suggestion that we could actually use the internet to count police shootings. Uh, that wasn't possible back 20 years ago. Julie Tate and Jen Jenkins, our researchers, came up with a way to search websites around the country so that we would be flagged. Because one thing that does happen when the police kill someone is that they typically tell the press and it typically gets reported on. We had John Moiskins from the, then the graphics department get involved and, and sort of figure out what that would look like. And once that was built with the assistance of like Ted Melnick and Stephen Rich and other people, uh, we started putting those shootings into the database. I remember the day that it, it, we put it up on the board in the conference room and people were like, holy cow, we can say a lot with this data. Uh, we found um, pretty quickly that um, about half of the fatal police shootings were not being recorded by the DOJ or by the FBI. The Michael Brown shooting in itself raised the question of how often these shootings were actually happening. Nobody could really answer it. Um, it certainly, given the attention on the Michael Brown case, it certainly felt like they were happening every day. Uh, and um, once we started the counting, we actually found they were happening about three times a day. The power of data, Jeff. Yeah, that was, that was my thought too. That line she says where uh, in there about how data can really help you see the world differently. So, yeah, so they, the, uh, I mean, the, the key thing to remember here is um, that the CDC is prevented, I believe by law from reporting on gun violence and that the one agency that does do it at a national level, because these are local police forces, so state and local government, but the, the FBI was undercounting by half. <laughs> uh, and then the other with data is the disparate, you, you get to see reality in a different lens. So we find that a disproportionate of people shot, fatally shot by police are black and young and males. And um, so that the, the, the ability to search your communities, to filter, to engage with this type of data and see it through a different light just empowers us as citizens to, when the federal government has failed us in this recognition of, of not just gun violence, but, but, um, uh, but police force. Then of course, several years later, uh, uh, George Floyd. So um, we thought that this was kind of, a, as you saw there, groundbreaking usage of data journalism, interactive journalism to help us uh, see these stories uh, very differently. The power of social video uh, was also an important uh, consideration for this round of Peabody. This next awardee, Anita Sarkeesian, had her life threatened for exposing gender bias in games. If you want to get
get to know a character, learn about their interests, goals, or desires, their butt is probably not going to give you that information. Hi, I'm Anita Sarkeesian. I am the creator and director of Feminist Frequency. Uh, it was a video series that looked at the way women were represented in popular culture. At its core, Feminist Frequency was created because stories matter. What are those stories telling us? What are the values embedded in that? And if we tell different stories, can we change our society? The work that I did with Feminist Frequency received an enormous backlash for, you know, for challenging the status quo of gaming as a male-dominated space. Let's call this what it is. You and the other feminazis in the gamer world. I was just one voice in the rise of voices that came up as social media started to become bolder and bigger and more voices were being amplified. Over the years, as Feminist Frequency has shifted and grown and we've made different video series, it became really apparent that abuses in the games industry and toxicity in the games industry and gaming communities was of paramount importance, that we really needed to address these issues. Donna, why was it important to honor Anita in this work? Because the work matters. Um, and, and what she did, again, if we're, if stories ask you to kind of, uh, take a look at the world around you, um, that is what that social, those social videos, especially those first ones did. And what happens that the people who were taking a look around, around them did not want to. And that's what caused, I mean, to say that she had, uh, a few death threats is quite the understatement. Um, and sometimes things have to get really dark for people to decide that they've got to find a light to shine. And that's what this did. And you look at when that was done to where we are now with like what an absolute debacle the quote unquote leadership at Activision is. And I'm a gamer. And so I am appalled by everything that's gone on in this industry, but there is greatness in the industry. And I think by what Anita did and by having it in this format, um she was able to be humorous in intent and was able to rally a lot of people and yes there was a lot of voices on the, the on the horrible side but then it also allowed other voices to as she says to raise up and say we can be better we are media these are things that are is within our powers to do to also change not only our own industry but the people who, who love our industry and, and things outside of it so um, I think it was again the right format for the work. How powerful are games? How big is the gaming industry now as a cultural force Diana? Why is this an important category? I mean games are bigger than most country's GDP, um, you know, to be frank, and the, and the economics around it, and the number of players, and it's not just, we can, we, we can just say games, if we, if we really think about it, since, you know, Google bought um, YouTube in 2008, and with the iPhone coming up, most, the largest part of the population now has grown up with an interface and have grown up with some type of game mechanic, whether you want to call it gaming or gamers as a game mechanic and how we talk to Alexa and Siri and everything else. This is, and so game as a category is one thing. The idea of how we interact with an interface is an even larger category. So they, you know, so it is like circle on circle in so many ways. Um, and so, to look at the storytelling in these types, in this category specifically, is not only just about like the boldness and the brashness and, and the creativity and ingenuity behind that, that, you have to think about how big that audience is. And now it is, it's getting out the message and the stories even wider than, than honestly than other formats. Totally, the power of game engines across, not just to the cultural industry, but moving into so many sectors. Um, it's undeniable. Um, but there were three legacy games that uh, Peabody honored, Papers, Please, and Journey. Um, they're both very different. Can you talk about those two quickly? Yeah, so different. Quickly. <laughs> uh, different intent. Um, again, Papers, Please, what is so interesting about it, um, it is, you know, simply checking passports as the game. And what's interesting is I'd actually missed the game and I had first watched, they had done a um, narrative YouTube video that was the same story. And I thought that story was so powerful. And then it said, you know, based on the game and I'm like, what game? And so then I immediately went and then played the games back in, 
I get, I even forget what year it was. Um, but by it being a game, I was already, uh, I already had the tension of a thriller in the video. But then as a game, my heart is racing as we're trying to what, look at every piece of the passport and make sure, can this person go through? Can they not go through? And the fact that there were, I believe, some 18 or 20 or 20, 20 endings, I think, to that game. And so at each point, your experience was different and you're trying to best yourself, but also figure out the game. Uh, it was just a, a, a feat, again, another feat of creativity. And then um, with Journey, it was the beauty of the art in this format. In um, again, you know, gaming has been the, for such a long time, has been in the shadow of film and television and has, and has in a lot of ways been seen as lesser than as an art form and as a storytelling form and as a form that allows people to find entertainment. And then it just said, fine, you're gonna underestimate me. And that's in, and, and Journey brought together all parts. It brought together art, it brought together the mechanics of gaming, it brought together um, storytelling. Um, and the third and game awarded. Hmm? Sorry to interrupt. Um, for the sake of time, we're going to move to the third game, uh, which is uh, Never Alone. It was a puzzle platformer, and we're just going to show a quick clip of that before we move to our last part of the Legacy Awards. The creation of Never Alone was inspired by the culture and the spirit of our people. CITC was looking for ways in which we could promote self-determination. And our board directed us to pick up the tools of the modern world and really search to look for connectivity to the broader world. We found a firm, Eline Media, in the video gaming business whose values aligned with our values. We were fascinated by the idea of stories that had been passed down for thousands of years, one generation guiding another through oral storytelling. And the idea of bringing these stories into an immersive new interactive media was a, a daunting but fascinating and exhilarating challenge. And everything was done through an inclusive development process. In many of our early conversations with Gloria and her team, um, they were very deliberate in their goals of both connecting with the youth uh, within the Alaska Native community and at the same time, find a medium that could broadcast, that could invite a global community to participate in these in this rich tradition, these rich stories. And so games um, were a natural fit. We decided very early on along with the community that this would be a cooperative game. The, the core characters of the game, Nuna and Fox, um, have different skills and abilities. Um, and they need to work together to overcome adversity throughout the entire uh, experience. And that form of cooperation, that form of interdependence um, exudes not only through the characters, but in the mechanics themselves and then through the story. This incredible cooperative game, it really circles back to co-creation, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just reiterate a lot of what they said here. To me, it's the connecting the past and the present. So indigenous communities are highly uh, dependent on oral storytelling, but a deep concern for younger generations uh, not being receptive. So let's think about ways we can use new technologies to do that. And what I really liked was the way that this firm almost ethnographically kept going back to the community to get feedback. So it's a different kind of game creation, but really trying to do it with the community, not for the community, so. We're gonna close now with the final two legacy awards. Um, one was to uh, fill you as an individual trailblazer award for the blog, Angry Asian Man. My name is Phil Yu. I'm the founder and editor of the blog, Angry Asian Man. It is a news and opinion culture blog covering the Asian American community. I grew up watching tons of movies and television. I'm a child of pop culture. I rarely ever saw stories or people or characters that reflected my experience. It just felt like there was a misrepresentation or just invisibility when it came to, you know, the way Asians were depicted on screen. When I started the blog, a lot of what I wrote about was stuff I was seeing in the news, the representation of Asian Americans in the media and the lack thereof. 
and it just seemed like a really uh, potent way to just talk about the things that I felt I've been feeling my whole life. When I felt the sting of racism or prejudice in some ways, it it was flung my way in a way that said like, what are you gonna do about it? I mean, like, why don't you just take it? But I think the idea that an angry Asian to anything for the longest time was kind of like, it felt like an oxymoron or something. It just didn't mesh the idea of angry and Asians. I felt like no more. Like, I don't want to, like, I'm not going to be the person who just sits there and takes it. And so angry Asian man was a, a, a large part of that channeling that energy. And let me tell you, sometimes it felt like I was very alone. And our last word, also individual, is for field building uh, to Nani de la Pena, who um, Forbes magazine dubbed the godmother of VR. Hunger in Los Angeles is a piece that I think I'm best known for having premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, um, which put people on scene at a real story in Los Angeles, where a man with diabetes didn't get food in time and he collapsed into a diabetic coma. That was a, a pivotal moment um, in terms of the uh, beginnings of my career in, in creating this idea of we could use virtual reality for journalism. Immersive journalism, it's, it's, it's a whole new um, fully embodied experience that uniquely positions people to have a visceral experience and a visceral understanding of, of a news story. We did a piece on solitary confinement with Frontline, uh, that piece where we did scanning of an actual solitary confinement cell, well, now you're in that cell, you're in that room, and it has a real different effect on your entire body and your sense of, oh my God, now I understand why solitary confinement is so uh, cruel and unnecessary. I have to say, winning a Peabody, it's sort of a lifetime dream. Gaming people, to journalism people, to university professors, I got so much pushback. And to be at this point now in my life where I would get a Peabody Award, all I can say is thank you. It's incredibly meaningful. Dinah, what's what's so remarkable about Phil and Nani in the history and, and awarding them a Peabody in 2022? I think what you can see from both of them was that in being creators, they were both lonely. Um, and but also just doing the work. And I think to go back to the word of being bold, both of them um, were saw other ways in which to get meaning and story out there. And they were alone creating and not knowing what impact they were having. Um, and I think, and you saw it in the emotion of when, you know, how, how Nani accepted the award. And even to this day, Phil thinks that. I'm punking him when he when I called to say he was getting this. He doesn't believe it. Because he's he, he's so shocked by it, and it's because they were just doing the work, and they were doing the work uh, creatively and boldly and with meaning and intent, um, not knowing that they were gathering community around them. That they, in Noni's case, that you know what she was able to do was uh, affect legislation. Um, she also pushed VR. She, uh, people are, I mean, I was got into VR because of her. And so I think by giving both of them, awarding them these Peabody's for the work they have done that they have deserved um, was, gave them the ability to see the impact that they had not only on communities, but on the storytelling format. That's it, 16 Legacy Awards. What's next, Jeff, for us? Uh, so this was a way of uh, highlighting this, what we're recognizing now. So we will begin recognizing winners from the last year and uh, those submissions open at the end of June through the summer. And this board will begin judging them in the fall with announcements of annual winners like we have done for 82 years. <laughs> with radio and television, uh, but now in this area. So that's where we're headed. Thank you. I'm gonna invite all our esteemed panelists from Open Documentary Lab um, to join us, turn on their cameras. I'm sure there's lots of questions as everybody's uh, lining up though. There is a question about um, from Martin Percy in the Q&A about 
uh, you know, these are old technologies. Are we now going to be facing, how are we going to deal with new technologies and the newest and the latest? Is there any sense of that yet, Diana, or how are we going to deal with the shiny new? I think we just have to deal with it. I don't <laughs> I think we'd be like most creators. We just have to like just just do it, and we just have to figure it out because it's important too. So um, it's something we are, you know, as you know, we're all actively thinking about. Over well, I, and like I said, I mean, I I don't think categories are important. So uh, you know, if it's out there in the universe, we just need to gobble it up and see: yep. did it use its technology well? Did it tell a story that was important? Did it do both of those in a meaningful, powerful way? So. Bring it on. <laughs> yep. just gotta do it. Sarah. Hi, um, first, thank you so much for this amazing presentation, conversation, and for this work, um, talking about bold and creative and visionary thinking. It's all of you too, for, for awarding these projects in this way. Um, I had a couple questions, but I'll stick with just one to give people, other people on talk. Speaking of technology and the and what matters and impact, and you've you've done a wonderful way of describing how you're choosing, you know, how you're defining impact and, and what matters. But I did have a question about accessibility and how, you know, some of these projects are not accessible. Like most people do not have the headsets or do not have the game platform to play them. And I, I was curious if that, how you dealt with that and thought about that, if that came up at all in your discussions. Yeah, I mean, one of the most innovative spaces are exhibits. Uh, and we, in, uh, in the tradition of Peabody, uh, because of it's a broadcasting award, and I say that literal of, of the term, uh, that that, that the, the, the materials need to be accessible. Uh, and so exhibits in Berlin or New York or LA or Dallas or where have you, while they may be cutting edge with technology, aren't publicly available. But you raise the issue too, though, that even when the VR space itself, uh, that they're not maybe as accessible. You know, uh, Facebook would like it different and have every user have their own... Uh, uh, Oculus, et cetera. But um, for me, they are enough accessible. Uh, my son has an Oculus. I get that I'm privileged. I get he's the son of a professor. But, 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 but there are commercial outlets for these things. There are commercial stores for these things. Right now, you know, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, you know, the, the world changes where we're having to subscribe what Walt Oscar Gandhi 30 years ago called the paper society. So yes, I, I get, you know, uh, how much do our, our libraries and archives make this stuff available? Uh, there's always that tension at play. But for us, the defining feature is, are they commercially available to a, a broad public, not just for elites in these circles that can go to Berlin to see you know, something? So you, you have to balance. Uh, it says a lot. We're not in an era where you turn on a TV set in 1952 and it's free because of advertisers. Now we're in a different world, but they are generally accessible uh, with the limitations that I've drawn out there. And But then also like to add to that, um, Jeff, that um, many of these projects will have something that uh, is publicly available, whether it's just a YouTube video, Vimeo, whatever it is. So that's also a way because part of, mission is too big of a, of a word, but part of what we're also saying is that we need to figure out better archiving for all of these projects. Um, and by us saying like, oh, this is an amazing VR project and people can only watch like a three minute video, maybe that will inspire someone to go out and get the headset or to find something. So that's also part of our job is to say, this, this amazing storytelling is happening on this video game platform on this or on that. And if you really, really wanna be a part of this and see it and experience it more, you have the ability to. Um, so that's you know part of our mission as well. Thanks, uh, Anita. Hello, um, so I had a, first off this work is amazing and for Peabody to be a, an award that's so different and how it defines an award and how to get there, very impressive. Um, so quickly, I'm a psychiatrist um, and uh, I was gracious enough to be an MIT ODL fellow. And um, 
one of the things that I always am very concerned about is the subjects and these individuals and being re-traumatized. Most of the people's stories, you know, that are, we want to share are very, um, you know, they, they're, there's trauma to them. And that's kind of why uh, it's, it's kind of like a self-selecting group in a way. And so, you know, I haven't seen many trauma-informed practices, but more importantly, sometimes you don't even know what you don't know. And there's a fallout after the filming. Um, I've seen, you know, patients who committed suicide after they have filmed. I've seen, um, you know, because the breadth of experience is so big, right? So you may have someone who has trauma, but you may have someone who's bipolar, right? And so there's a huge spectrum. And how do we account for that um, is very important to me. Um, the only sort of thing that I've thought through is I know um, Kat had mentioned she was a film maker in residence at a hospital. I feel like every place should have a psychiatrist in residence in whatever they're doing for accountability. And what's even more scary as we go to XR and VR is it's becoming even more pervasive and even closer to the human experience. I mean, these are actual treatments for PTSD for soldiers, right? So very, very um, invasive. And I remember one of my psychiatrist friends saying, well, I'm happy we've mastered the human world because now we can keep moving on and above, you know, like we barely even know the difference between hunger and angry. We call it hangry. You know what I mean? So that's kind of where my concern really comes into play. And I would love to hear how you guys are thinking through that as well. I taught documentary film for a long time, and I remember some Jewish scholars talking to me about the rich or uh, literature around documentary and the Holocaust, and basically saying uh, that I, as a teacher, even needed to study that. You know, I, I, I think that the ethical, moral uh, dimensions of what you talk about, I mentioned a, a torture prison. Uh, are significant. I don't know what as an awards program or, or our uh, responsibilities in this space. And I hope that producers are actively engaged in those conversations, but I appreciate you bringing it up. Certainly it's something we need to consider. Uh, as you say that when the digital technologies render experiences in such profound and intense ways, that there is always an impact and, and derivative effect. And in what regard with those being in the public sphere, do we all have obligations to pay attention to uh, their potential negative impact? So thank you for your question. Don't have a good answer for you, but I will certainly think about it differently because you asked the question, so thank you. I can just jump in too that for, for us at Co-Creation Studio in talking with folks in the field about co-creation and, and Kipu, for example, who were honored in this, in this round, um, trauma-informed practice is central to the work. Um, making media that is tied to equity and justice is key to the work. Doing work that contributes to healing <laughs> is central to the work. And, uh, you know, for sure with Kipu, um, that was very front and center in the way that they talked about the work and even represented the work as it moved forward and throughout the world. So um, definitely a huge, huge part of co-creation. Diana, I don't know if you want to answer that one as well. No, I mean, just, uh, we. It's, this is, this is an award organization. I think uh, your question is is very is very important. Um, however, we're this is an award organization. So, from and coming as a producer and as a creator and as a filmmaker, it's something that we will think about on the front end. But this is an award organization. And it's definitely part of stories that matter too, right? When healing is part of <laughs> the, the meaning and the mattering. Well, everything can be for good and for bad. And we hope that by shining light, when people do talk about things that will, that do trigger that, you know, why is this coming back up? It does also evolve the conversation so that we can, we can't get to healing and understanding without also going through some of the pain. Yeah. Thank you, Diana. I'm just gonna um, ask Tamara and Milad to, um, to ask their questions or, or make their comments, just to make sure we hear from you both before we close out. We only have about four minutes left. Tamara. Sure, um, thank you. This was, I got nostalgic watching it because um, it, it takes me back. Like I started remembering the first time I saw Notes on Blindness and even like your work, Kat, which is, was amazing and, and Kipu and all these projects that have influenced my practice. 
Um, and I think about how often when you're doing this type of work and having to come up with new ways of telling stories, the work isn't recognized at that time exactly, but it leads to other things. So it's really nice to see um, this original work being recognized. Um, my question is kind of around the, the tech divide um, that is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, I, I finished a project recently, which I tend to design things in a way that they're scalable. So there's multiple points of access and connecting to audiences. And it kind of relates, I guess, to what Sarah was discussing. And I was wondering if, if this issue of like accessibility when it comes to like um, I understand that, you know, most things are available on headsets, but I recently traveled around the US and there's parts of the South where there's no internet and I'm working on a project with farmers and they are, they have to train using an app to get certain certifications. So they all had to travel to another town in order to be able to access internet to get training. So even with these certain types of things, I wonder if there's ways that broader communities who maybe don't have access to internet in the US, which a lot of people, I didn't know that there was places where people couldn't access the internet um, to this level, um, could, could maybe connect to these projects that are so pivotal, I guess, in, in the creation of this, this medium or what your thoughts were in regards to, to this tech divide and how it relates to this legacy as well. Thank you, and Milad. Yeah. I would uh, echo everyone's uh, gratitude towards this presentation. And I wanted to ask in terms of, as an award organization, uh, with the notion of stories that matter and data that matters, what are vehicles or tools you've seen for cohesion for these expanded actual uh, formats of storytelling that convey that story still? So what are, uh, in terms of the, the awards themselves, uh, they, they range in the, the mediums that they present themselves. And so what are, how do you decipher like, oh, this is very cohesive. It's very potent in a sense. Tech divide and the power of the work. Diana, Jeff. I feel like both of those are, are so um, intermingled. Um, but the tech divide, it's something I think about a lot because it is, it is I find it, shocking and confusing that people don't know that there's not internet all throughout the country. I think we so focus on other countries and I'm like, oh, we have problems here, a lot of problems. So um, again, what I'm hoping, you know, and Jeff as representative of the organization will have, you know, have his own perspective, but my perspective as someone very active on this board and believing in not only what this award can do, but what the creators are doing is that we have to keep shining the light on these issues. So we have to continue to shine the light on the fact that people don't have internet, cannot enjoy this. So what can we do to start to poke more at that wall and break it down? And then in terms of looking at like the, the cohesion, I think that's the excitement of it because um, I, I personally am excited by what I don't know and how I can um, uh, help these creators out there who are like, we don't know, and we're gonna jump in there and we're gonna do this and we're gonna try to figure it out. And we're gonna pluck all these, whether it's open source tools or it's, you know, Unreal or it's, you know, what, in, how can I talk to NVIDIA? All those things that they're trying to cluge all these parts together to tell a story. And it's never, when it works really well, it's not one above the other, it's working cohesion is the intersection of storytelling and technology to create an amazing experience for a community to come together and experience. So that is really what we look for is that, that um, more broad cohesion. Um, and then we get into the nitty gritty of like, oh my gosh, you put together this open source thing and use this and that's how you put it together. Like that's, that's the excitement. That's the, that's the unknown that, that we're looking to uncover that we can with this award. The special sauce. Jeff, yeah. final word to you. I, I won't add anything, I, but we, is, does Vivek, do you have a, do you have a, do you have a comment, sir? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll cede my time. <laughs> No, I just wanted to thank you all. I, I, I sort of stepped back so that there, the, the, our, our fellows could um, could ask their amazing questions as always. And I just wanted to thank you for um, for spending this time. It was incredibly inspiring. And you know, I think that um, you know one of the things that struck me is is you know when you're talking about the impact of individual projects, um, the impact of this shift 
in Peabody as an organization, um, you know, it stands to have a great amount of impact in terms of the maker community and, and you know, that, that kind of, um, the importance of the recognition that you saw in the, in the last two awardees, you know, I think that, that the shift towards, you know, A, this slate um, of, of awards and then moving forward with this category is going to have a tremendous impact in terms of makers realizing that their work is in these new ways and of storytelling is valued in and in, in recognized in this way. So I just thank you for that. Thank you so much, Vivek, and thank you, Jeff and Diana, for joining us today. This has been a beautiful, like. Uh, like Tamara said, it was very nostalgic, both to look back at, at the work, but also at our time together and moments before the pandemic landed. That was our first, first and last in full, full board in real life meeting. I hope to meet soon. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time to dive into these things today with us. I want to thank also our panelists um, from the lab and the studio and our funders, MacArthur Foundation and Just Films at Ford Foundation. This is the last talk of the series. Uh, this semester. We'll be back. I can't believe I'm saying this. It's the first time. See you in September. <laughs> and um, thanks as always for watching. Take care.